for those of you who are just just joining, we're gonna give it one minute, kind of let the people transition over from the other meeting that just ended. Um, we're 55 people, this is good. So um, for those just kind of a bit of format here, what we're gonna do is spend probably the first half of this, I wanna go through some examples and uh, highlight the cool things that the service provider community has been working on for the last few years with promo standards. I think you'll find um, that the strength of promo standards has really come out with the cool tools and services that people have determined and figured out how to do and market these services for the industry. Um, it's kind of getting set up here. So give me a second. Um, yeah, just one other important piece. Me and Promo Standards are, this is not an endorsement of any of these companies. Um, many of them have reviews and I, I can put you in contact with lots of people who have worked with all of these service providers. Um, so just know that nobody's paying me to do anything here. Uh, this is all 100% volunteer. Now I'm repping my Promo Standards shirt so I don't get catch flack for wearing different uh, service providers, uh, you know, gear. So. All right, let's start this party. It's 2.02. Uh, we probably have you know, 50 minutes total content here. Uh, so as I said, we're going to hit some service provider offerings and we're going to get a developer panel here and we're going to get four developers from four different service providers. So you kind of you know walk through some of the journey that they've had and it's kind of they face some unique scale questions and challenges with promo standards. And, you know, I think it's important that we all kind of, I think we can learn from each of them in our organizations. So uh, yeah, let's start this party. So uh, one thing here, so this is our first installment of Promo Standard to You. Uh, we just whipped up this funky logo here to um, probably make Eric Gillespie's head explode because we create variants of the logo all the time and he's a big fan of branding. But uh, uh, and also this was my attempt to be a, a fake Hogwarts, um, but this is actually a college in uh, Australia. So. So real quick, every third Tuesday of the month for the next year, we are going to do an hour of education. So if you just want to go ahead and block that time off in your calendar so you can get some awesome education. Uh, it's not always going to be me. Uh, we're going to try to, as Ashley said, mix it up, do some round tables, do some interactive discussions. So we're going to try to have a little bit of content up front and then make sure that we can, you know, we'll get into breakouts as we uh, progress this thing and move forward. Uh, all of these will be recorded. So Jessica and Schultz will probably post these to our YouTube channel. So if there's other people in your team that you want to show or kind of you know uh, get on board, we're definitely going to make that a little easier for you than in the past. So that being said, so Promo Energy, what is it? So we realize that our only communication can't be one time a year. Uh, we need a regular cadence for education. So I think one of the, you know, we've tentatively put together this schedule as we move forward. Um, some of you are members of Promo Standards, I would say most. So obviously we will have two, con two pieces of content a year for the wider community. But at the end of the day, we wanna focus on some member only uh, content. And then the next one in March being a very uh, strategic one, we'll get Eric Schoenbarger and some of the members of the uh, standards committee to get that first dive into what Eric just talked about in the last hour, uh, order status 2.0. So that's really where we get into that issue resolution. And I, by next March, we'll be able to peek into that world and start showing exactly what we're talking about here, because it takes the order status standard from just being a G whiz informational standard, which is very valuable in terms of ROI and moves it to that next level. So as you can see, we're gonna, you know, this is our tentative schedule, third Tuesday, every month, one o'clock Eastern, be there. Uh, obviously there's a pretty big important one down there, the old Tampa, uh, hopefully Tampa-ish in-person event. We're gonna lock that date in, hopefully in the next one to two weeks. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, this is, you know, our, Promo Standards Technology Summit that we're super excited to, and Hackathon, that we're super excited to push. So having said that, all right. So 
I think one of the um, big iterations in promo standards in the last year is realizing the power of the community and the power that there are a lot of amazing service provider, software providers, solutions providers, you, you know, put whatever S word you want into in there, but they're making awesome things that are utilizing promo standards, right? And it's a way for smaller entities, both suppliers and dis distributors and larger entities to get quick ROI and to reach a large group of people. You know, for example, you know, if you want to reach the 200 facilities group members or the 600 common SKU users or the thousand AIM users, right? The, the easiest way to get your order status to those people is through the service providers that are implementing these tools. So um, I'm going to go through top to bottom as many different ones, focusing on the ones that are members of Promo Standards. Um, and we'll kind of get this going. Um, and I think most importantly, and I think we've seen this more in the last two months, this shows that a truly open standard for the industry benefits everybody, right? It just doesn't benefit one or two entities. And I think it's super important that, you know, as a non-for-profit, we are here to reduce that transactional friction, right? We don't want, um, you know, we're not sitting, nobody in promo standards is trying to monetize this as the board or the members. Obviously service providers are out there selling services around this and it's good for them, but as a board and organization, we, we have one goal is to you know, drive adoption um, and streamline everybody's digital strategies. So having said that, let's, I'm gonna go through um, probably 15, 20 minutes here. Uh, exactly, you know, I'm gonna spend a, probably a few minutes per service provider. I think it's important. Like I said, these, these are not uh, commercials, no free ads and promo standards. Uh, these are not endorsements, but I think it's pretty powerful to know that the largest entities and software providers of the industry are very heavily involved in promo standards. So uh, Facilis Group, we'll start with them. Uh, Ashley, as you might have heard, is our uh, Membership Marketing Education Committee Chair. Uh, she does pretty cool things over at Facilis. If, if you, uh, I was poking around their website the other day and found them a, a crazy job posting. So, um, you know, I guess any company that's looking for multiple data scientists always, uh, you know, kind of peaks and in interests of some things that they're up to. So obviously Facilis Group is a, um, you know, very large platform with, like I said, over 200 members. Uh, they have a few core products, but, and I know personally speaking with my Starline hat on, um, one of the early order status and order shipment notification adopters. So obviously their Syncor product is very heavily using order status, shipment notifications and inventory. Um, you know, I, we'll get to some more screenshots as we move forward here. But I think the one of the biggest points of um, to talk about here is purchase order integration. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, this is where the real some serious ROI is going to take that next jump from the force status or shipment notification inventory to streamlining the order process. And I say this a lot, if, if you're trying to eliminate that, you know, four to five bucks that you're, you know, your whatever you want to call your order entry costs and your order processing costs. Um, I don't think that that's not the low hanging fruit we're after, right? It's what's streamlining is that seamless solution, that accuracy, the, you know, no. yes, it takes me a few minutes to get a purchase order entered, but how long does it take you to get to follow up for all the incorrect information? So as you'll see a general theme, there's a lot, a lot of service providers who are, I would say by the second half of 2022, are going to be really launching forward in their purchase order initiatives. So um, obviously, uh, you know, Facilis has some other pretty cool things, uh, commercial that they're working on, uh, full service e-commerce e platforms store, that is going to use everything from promo standards across the board. So, um, you know, I think for these guys, be able to look out there, you know, especially if you're a supplier doing promo standards, um, if you're a part of this group, these guys are going to come knocking your way, uh, looking to get your stuff integrated pretty, pretty soon. Uh, another one of our board members, uh, Eric Lesley, just spoke a few members a few moments ago in our membership meeting. Uh, he is in charge of a company, Essent, and uh, Steve who you'll hear from in a little bit here. He's very, very active. He's probably, uh, probably written three of our standards for uh, the documents, you know, top to bottom. So 
Um, these guys know what they're doing. So what do they do with promo standards? <laughs> a little bit of everything, right? Their software has promo standards integrated inside of it. If you look and poke around the promo standards endpoint listing, you'll notice that many of the, uh, the supplier endpoints are hosted by Essent. So these guys are doing development of all this different, you know, every standard they're supporting, as well as integrating this within their system. So somebody asked in the last session, what's the quickest way or the cheapest way to kind of get started? Um, you know, you'll see Essence, one of the providers, I'm about to get to another one in a second, who's offering services to develop. Uh, a lot of these depend on, you know, what systems you're using, what your capabilities are, but in the last five years of these companies doing this, they've they've made it pretty easy. I think somebody has said that they can spend these endpoints up within an hour and pretty much get you live and rocking and rolling and being promo standards compliant. So um, we are recording this and I'm going to post this after the fact. So if you're kind of like, hey, you know, what is this? Um, you know, you can definitely hit up some of these URLs and contact information afterwards. So. Um, as you see, I mean, we can look at numbers of 50 million transactions on promo standards protocols, right? So these are real quick ways to get reach a larger audience. So that's Essent. Um, Schultz being Schultz made these nice graphics. So give me a few seconds to here to kind of talk about Common SKU. So uh, Common SKU is a um, software, um, I guess software as a service, however you want to call it, web-based. They have pretty much, you know, I think they get famous for a lot of their community and a lot of their uh, outreach and some of their events. But at the end of the day, they have been a very early promo standards adopter as well. Um, pretty much doing, you know, inventory, pr product data, or the whole gamut, right? I think they, they kind of have their hands in a little bit of everything in terms of promo standards. So um, Eric Schoenberg and I like to joke that um, nobody, Everybody thought they had clean product data until these guys get a hold of it. And you have Robert telling you how bad your product data is all the time. So um, I, unfortunately for Common Skew, they've probably um, had to deal with some supplier headaches of cleaning up people's data. But uh, these guys are, are doing a lot. Uh, just kind of give you some examples that Schultz sent me. Um, they, you know, they're obviously real-time inventory right, right within their system. So I think more if, if you're a, a lot of suppliers don't ever see what these services end up enabling. They just see that, hey, uh, distributor X pulled my service 20 times today. I really don't know what they're doing. So, you know, some of these uh, examples you'll see moving forward highlight what is actually happening. And Robert is one of the developers and Thomas Hughes is gonna join our panel uh, in a little bit later on here. So, um, you know, obviously the ability to pull real time promo standards decoration locations through the PPPC service, prior price configuration, uh, I think that goes a long way into taking out that um, the concept of handwriting decoration locations and having my order entry team try to guess what it is on the way in. So uh, these guys are those pretty cool things with electronic purchase orders. Um, and then obviously the ability to submit uh, POs right in their system directly to the suppliers is kind of a big deal as well. Um, so as somebody who's been doing this with them for a year and a half now, um, it works, All right? We joked the other day, um, we had a nearly six figure order come through um, that came in through electronically through promo standards and nobody noticed that it was in house until it got to my art department through an automated process. And an artist was the first person to see it and thought to question why nobody had QC the OE process on a large order like this. So um, we altered our processes obviously. So that's common skew. Um, you know, been very at this. Another uh, group here, uh, Tiffany and crew at Distributor Central, they've been OGs of promo standards. They were at the first technology summit and was adopting inventory, probably the first company in the industry to adopt the inventory standard. So they've been at it. I think one thing you, you'll see now from uh, Distributor Central, one source, they, they have taken this thing and you know, and Chris is actually joining our panel here in a, in a few minutes. Um, he's been, a, he's a, you know, very, he knows more about promo standards, the ins and outs of consuming and developing this than anybody. So he's always a great resource when you have questions. Uh, but we, right now they have 400, they've converted 400 suppliers data that they had in their system and are now regurgitating that, probably that's not the best term for it, but they're refeeding that back out to the community and promo standards compliant beads. So they are taking, 
you know, where me as one supplier Starline, they are doing this times 400. And, you know, our host, if you, that's another thing, if you look on the promo center's endpoint listing, um, Distributor Central slash one source is hosting a ton and ton of, of supplier endpoints. That's what that next number is 1800 promo standards endpoints. So, you know, it's another great source if you're looking to get promo standards compliant, whatever you want to call that. Uh, if you want to get this up and running quickly and you don't have a developer team, um, these guys are probably a, a good resource to hit up. Uh, you know, it's, if you're in our Slack channel, Tiffany uh, is there, um, Chris is in there, and Pablo is on our standards committee. So, Pablo uh, was one of the first people to break some of my endpoints by crushing it. Uh, and then we learned within a few hours that we need to start caching all this stuff. So, you know, 12 million requests per month, um, that's no small feat, right? So these guys are consuming and ho they are hosting and consuming. I would say, you know, definitely a big stop um, if, if you're kind of looking for a, a quick way to get going with promo standards. So, and I would say another misnomer here, don't think that this is only for the small players, um, the smaller distributors, uh, service players. I know these guys are hosting data for some very large players in the industry. So definitely one source, you Google one source, Sherry Central, you'll see some pretty cool things that they're working on. Um, next, I speak of some OGs of promo standards, uh, Sam and Dino, they've been around. Dino's uh, also gonna be on our developer uh, panel here in a little bit. So if I miss anything, Dino, you can correct me there. Um, but I would say probably one of the largest platforms that we keep hearing about in the industry and it's taking off like just hot fire is NetSuite, right? And Sam and crew were had enough foresight to marry both promo standards and NetSuite together and build a lot of plugins to NetSuite. Uh, and as they claim here, it's the only built for NetSuite certified promo standard solution. So I think both sides of it, we're seeing they're, you know, they're placing, doing tons of order management, tons of POs. If you're using NetSuite or thinking about using NetSuite, uh, to the best of my knowledge, Sam and crew are the um, only industry provider really who has, you know, custom out of the box, ready to go promo standard solution. So these guys are, if you're a supplier, they'll host your endpoints through NetSuite, they have that, or if you're a distributor, they will bolt on promo standards right into your NetSuite. So if you want to, you know, electronic place orders with Sandmar, with Alpha Broder, that whole gamut, um, hit up Dino. Uh, he's in Slack, Sam's in Slack, the whole crew's in Slack. Um, it's impressive. I mean, I think they were, like I said, they started at this very, very early on. And now they have, you know, bettered this and have become the gurus of NetSuite for the industry. So um, long time promo standard supporters. So we'll be like those guys. Uh, one that you might not have heard about as much. And I think I learned about them um, two years ago. I sat through a presentation in Vegas. And, you know, sometimes you forget that, hey, you know, there are tons of people using promo standards you might not even know about. So uh, met with the, the Zoom gals and realized that they are doing tons of promo standards integrations, right? They are. Um, you know, I think Zoom, everybody thought of Zoom as Zoom catalog, but I think they have tons of flyers and design studios that are real time. You can kind of see this uh, example GIF here. They're integrated with PCNA, for example, through promo standards, pooling real time product data, real time pricing, inventory data, and making sure that when people are using their platform and creating flyers, creating sites, creating stores, the whole gamut all these presentations are using real-time promo standards data through Zoom. So, um, you know, the Zoom crew just recently became promo standards members. Uh, I think we're excited to, you know, see their transformation. Uh, they obviously still are heavy in the e-catalog world, but I think you're seeing them branch more and more into the electronic presentations and, you know, interactive flyers and really grow. And the, I think we'll see a lot more out of them, especially on the heels of their promo standards integrations. So you can always just Google uh, Zoom catalog promo standards and bring up some Zoom studio stuff. So check these guys out. They're pretty cool to deal with. Um, another one here, and uh, sorry, I didn't have their logo. I left it off. Um, Antero Software, these guys are out of Texas. 
Um, they're the first ones to notify me anytime I break anything having to deal with promo standards. Um, it's another, you know, full fledged ERP software solution that has probably or very early on jumped on the promo standards bandwagon. So, you know, some, you know, obviously you get the uh, different aspects where, you know, Sam took a very commercialized NetSuite and bolted on promo standards. And then these guys who are rolling their own software solution are very much integrated with promo standards. You see this example here of, you know, their real-time pulling Sandmars inventory to check the apparel sizes. You know, these, you know, the, if you look over on the right, they're connected with 300, 312 different suppliers on promo standards. Uh, and they actually go as far as showing what percentage of their um, inventory and their suppliers are being live fed through promo standards. So you're seeing, you know, 64% of their products right now uh, in their platform are being live fed with inventory, right? So this is, you know, as a barometer for me, if I keep, you know, looking at that number, kind of let us know what our promo standards reaches into the industry, assuming that, you know, they have a fair sample representation of uh, the supplier activity. But I think it's just, you know, obviously as you go down, you see, you know, less um, integration. I think we see this overall as promo standards. The purchase order and invoice, it's a heavier lift uh, and you see it reflected in the Antero's numbers here, but definitely check these guys out. Um, you know, they, I say a little newer to the game in terms of promo standards, but in terms of knowledge and depth of promo standards, uh, these guys are pretty, pretty deep into there. Obviously, you know, if you're, if you have 312 suppliers, you're consuming data from, you're uh, no noob at this game here. So. Uh, just a few other things. Obviously, I was just some of their screenshots that I, I grabbed from their website. Um, you know, I think you, you see more now than anything the real-time inventory implications. Um, so here's you know, some creating a voucher for Sandmar. So um, another guy in the web store world, right? I think we'd be remiss. Uh, so Josh over at Bright Stores, another promo standards OG. He was probably one of the first uh, web store companies to I know start pulling Starlands data. But if you go check out Bright Stores and, you know, just Google Bright Stores uh, promo standards. They have a list of, it's about 30 something suppliers that they're real time integrating with. And I think, you know, their claim to fame is that, I mean, as somebody who's played around the web store world, it really sucks adding products manually. Um, these guys are adding products to your web, to their web stores, direct pulling, pricing and data and inventory from promo centers right in their stores. So, um, like I said, these guys have been at it for probably four years. And if you, you, know, you can go through their list of people they're integrated with, if you're a supplier, hit Josh up, hit that crew up over there because um, you know the, they've been in the, the web store world for quite a while now. Um, kind of a quieter uh, per group making a lot of noise lately in terms of integration with promise standards. Um, AIM, AIM group, you might know them as what, 1,300 different members. Um, they used to just be thought of as just this gargantuan buying group. Um, I think what you've seen lately out of them is a migration into software solutions for their members. And yeah, I very much know they've been doing, you know, inventory, product notifications, shipment notifications, all that order status for the last few years. Um, and I think that very interesting bullet points, that last one, uh, we're currently 90% completion on simple POs looking to go live in Q2. So you take somebody who's representing, you know, 1,300 different suppliers or different distributors and them working towards going live with purchase orders is going to be a huge, um, a huge jump in the number of electronic purchase orders that are being transacted across the business. So that one's going to be an exciting one. Um, these guys are kind of quieter, but also have been very heavily integrated with uh, promo standards. They, uh, you, you might know these guys as the, every holiday, they send you an email um, telling you how awesome the holiday is and uh, getting you to sign up for a demo for their software. Um, but yeah, as a uh, Diaspark, it's kind of back in that uh, Antero world. These guys, you know, I think they started in the jewelry uh, ERP world and realized that there was a lot of customized jewelry that had the same aspects as customized uh, promo and spun off a whole segment of their software. So these guys are very much um, 
you know, real deep in promo standards and also one of the biggest brand advocates for promo standards. They're constantly writing blogs, talking about the benefits of promo standards with their software people. So I had to give them a shout out. Um, they go as far as calling promo standards the digital language of the promotional products industry. So uh, anybody who throws that out there automatically gets some love from me. But you know, kind of, if you're also in that world, yeah, I think the taking a thousand steps back is there's a ton of service providers doing cool things with promo standards. And this speaks to the value of a truly open standard, right? Diaspark, you know, Facilis, uh, Essent, Distributor Central, whatever, they, they are free to do whatever they want to with promo standards. And that's what these standards were developed for is let the community decide what the best tools are and the best venues are. Um, everybody in the chat, I'll definitely hit the chat here in a few seconds when we get to the panel, but um, you know that. Uh, also, you might know Joel Moore. Joel Moore is another OG. I think he was at one of the first uh, technology summits we ever did. He's been very active. It's another one of those, um, you know, he has a technology solutions consulting company where they're, you know, taking promo standards and adopting it with legacy accounting manufacturing systems. It seems to be his forte there. So he's just another one. Uh, Joel's a good guy, been a longtime supporter, been a longtime member of promo standards. So, um, you know, if you're looking for a, you know, sometimes a more customized solution to work with your legacy system, Joel and crew, definitely the way to go. So I think right before we get in the panel here, because I think it'd be pretty interesting to talk to talk to this crew. Um, we have, I'm excited for the amount of volume that by the end of the year, we'll be going through promo standards purchase orders, right? If you take the combined buying power of, Facilis Group, which is massive. I mean, we're talking in the billions. Common SKUs in the billions. Essence in the many, many uh, millions. DCs in the millions. AIM Group probably in the billions. And Antares in the millions. Like we're going to take in 2022 a call it five to ten billion dollar chunk of this industry and throw onto being promo standards PO uh, uh, ready and being able to transact that business electronically. This is the real momentum shift in the wave that we've really been wanting and, and holding uh, out for. You know, I think, look, this isn't easy. I've onboarded a few of these companies. It sucks. Um, you know, I think going first and, and figuring out that journey. But as I think Dan and Michelle at Staples can attest to, once you get the first two done, then it's they start bolting them on. It becomes a lot easier every single one, right? Robert will probably tell you uh, some of the growing pains that he's gone through at Common Skew. Uh, getting this thing going. So I would say, you know, as we mentioned uh, an hour ago, 2022 is going to be a huge year for promo standards. Um, this right here, this slide right here has me the most excited just because I think this is where we kind of reached the utopia we've all been uh, holding out for. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We're going to see if we can pop on some of these panelists here. We're going to have, uh, sorry, I'm big with first names. Uh, Robert from Crime Excuse is going to join us. Dino from Extend Tech. Chris from DC. It looks like these guys are popping in now. And Steve from Essence. So um, we're going to kind of make this a little more, um, I would say, interactive at this point. So if you have questions for these guys, I'm going to monitor some of the chat here. I'm going to get to some of the chat that's been going on. Uh, I will definitely fire in questions uh, for these for these guys if you want to, um, you know, if there's anything in particular you're looking for them. Uh, real quick, Steve, Steve, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I don't right, have cool. a webcam. Uh, oh, gee. Okay, so uh, welcome. So as I said earlier, these guys have probably been in the weeds more than they would like to uh, admit with promo standards. They've all been, you know, in this for a long time. So just real quick, uh, we'll start with Robert. Can you show up first on my, uh, on my list here? Just kind of give us two seconds uh, where you are, where you work, and then uh, kind of, you know, well, let's go from there. Hi, I'm Robert. I work at Common SKU. We're a service provider uh, based in Canada, but with lots of uh, American suppliers and distributors on our system. We do pretty much all the promo standards spec specs. We've got them all implemented except maybe the invoice at this point. And uh, yeah, we've awesome. got lots of experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Robert. Uh, yeah, like I said, he'll fix your he'll fix your data when you think it's good. Um, all right, Chris, you uh, kind of introduce yourself here, kind of let us know what you do, because you, you've been making a lot of waves here with uh, promo standards as well. Sure, I'm Chris Schlimmer, uh, VP of Technology at Distributor Central. 
Um, we, like John said earlier, we were one of the first to adopt Provo standards inventory services um, through CSV and FTP five, six years ago, um, allowing suppliers to be able to have promo standards without having a you know really technical experience or, or background. Um, you know, something that we were, we decided to do two years ago is take a huge step by completely rewriting our platform from the ground up around promo standards. Our entire database is written around promo standards. Our entire ecosystem is. Um, you know, we, it was just a lot easier for us to take that, that opportunity and, and allows us to really adopt and, and grow promo standards the way we want it to. I'm going to come back and ask you some questions about that after we get to everybody, but uh, it's interesting that the promo standards data model was able to handle the existing hundreds and hundreds of suppliers you guys had on your platform. So uh, we'll come back to that, but to keep that in mind. Uh, Dino, another promo standards OG who is at uh, Extend Tech with the crew. Dino, can you introduce yourself here? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dino Bangerno, Managing Director at Extend Tech. Uh, three years here at Extend Tech, but a long time working in the distributor context. So consuming a lot of data and calling, calling out suppliers on data in their past. So um, good times there. But uh, within the NetSuite realm, what we provide are really pre-built plugins that enable suppliers to serve their endpoints. And we host endpoints of all services, including product compliance on the supplier side. And on the distributor side, we have over two dozen distributors running on the NetSuite platform that are consuming uh, data from supplier endpoints and are leveraging all services, including purchase order, just to varying degrees. Awesome. All right, Steve. Uh... Uh, I mentioned earlier as we were going through, you've crafted and authored many of our standards. Uh, can I introduce yourself here and let's uh, then we'll get going on some questions here. Yes, hello. Steve Lewiser, Vice President of Research at Essent Corporation. I've been involved with Promo Standards pretty much since its inception, and I'm currently a member on the Standards Committee and a liaison on the Best Practices Committee. Uh, my department oversees Promo Standards and other EDI initiatives within Essent, and um, myself and my team work directly with both suppliers and distributors to help them on their promo standards journey. Awesome, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I think we missed that in our member meeting. Steve sits on the, he's kind of a liaison between our best practices and standards committee. It's important for us as an organization to have that go back and that connection, that communication between the two. So a lot of times the best practices committee was like, look, if we could just like make these fields required, this would be so much more useful. So. Thanks for that, Steve. All right, I'm going to throw this out to uh, I'll throw Chris first, then Robert and um, Steve. You guys might be able to chime in here. Um, I think you guys, as service providers, have a unique look into scaling of promo standards, right? I mean, me as a supplier, I host 11 endpoints, uh, and we you know we roughly process 90 to 110,000 transactions a day, but you guys are doing that for me and then hundreds of other suppliers then obviously you're putting into your system. So Chris, is there, you know, do you guys run into scaling issues? What, what's your take and experience with, with this and, you know, kind of then we'll see if we can relate that back for all of our people on the call here. Sure. From a technical perspective, scaling the way we designed our database and our backend systems and it's all serverless based so it can grow infinitely uh, allows us to be able to handle this many uh, millions of transactions daily um, and can expand you know, infinitely. Um, that allows our distributors that are using our platform to be able to consume data in real time without worrying about whether the supplier can provide the data fast enough. Um, so that's you know, one of the biggest challenges. Some of these payloads are super, super big, these products. And so you know, we wanna be able to provide the same result across all suppliers. Um, so that's you know, something from that scale, from scaling on like onboarding, um, yes, I mean, a different size supplier, you know, some small suppliers have trouble providing a lot of the information for promo standards and the large ones do as well. So it's, you know, everyone has their own challenges. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that we offer is error reporting back for the suppliers to be able to tell them, you know, where their products are having problems. Um, for large and small, small suppliers, you know, the full gamma, we'll provide, you know, Starline hit all the way down to the mom and pop suppliers, the same reporting to be able to know really where your products stand in promo standards world. Um, and it helps us grow there too. Yeah, I just saw on, on that. I think we've, we've seen that, uh, you know, from you guys and a few others have, who have taken a more proactive approach. And the question came up in our last session of, you know, uh, Tony actually asked it about 
data integrity and how to beat the crap out of suppliers that are, you know, have bad data. And I think you guys and other service providers taking these proactive being like, look, like here's the 17 products you have that are missing product images and promo standards. I think that in itself is filling the gap of these, what used to be the staples and halos of the world that were self-policing some of our, our data. So awesome, Chris. Uh, Robert, I know you beat the crap out of a lot of my endpoints from time to time. Um, have you run into any scaling issues, especially with the number of distributors you guys are representing? I mean, I, I, I think... Yeah, I, th I think the the biggest scaling issue is with indiv individualized uh, uh, product pricing per distributor per supplier. So that's like M times N times P for the number of products. We don't really want to cash that much. We cash base level net pricing and list pricing, but when everybody has individualized pricing, um, that that we really rely on suppliers to have a low latency <laughs> as low as they can on providing uh, on on their pricing endpoints which is is problematic at, at times yeah so say so you have a lot more faith in the supplier community than most well um, we, we we default to the net net pricing if we, if we have to but uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's I, that's a big conversation for you know, you know in the product price configuration. There's three different price types, right? There's customer list, or it's list net, and then customer pricing. Well, the customer pricing at the end of the day is really what you know these service providers are after because that's the customer's actual price. So when you're looking to place configured orders, you need that customer pricing, which now takes it from being able to pull one supplier's product data for your entire community. Now you have to pull it for every single specific account you represent. So yeah, that's, uh, I know when we were going through that with you guys it was an interesting challenge. Steve, uh, any uh, scale issues, caching, you know, tips, kind of what you guys are seeing at Essent in terms of, you know, how you're yeah, handling one, this? One of, the, one of the big decisions is is how you're going to expose those endpoints if you're going to use, you know, public cloud or you're going to use on-prem. Obviously on-prem, you want to try to use, you know, the best hardware you can. It's not always possible with, you know, the limited budgets that we all have right now. Um, but definitely, um, if possible, try to segregate um, the promo standard systems from your live systems and cache data between the two um, so that during times of high usage, it doesn't really affect your production services like a denial of service attack. You know, and we do use optimized data warehouses and caching technology server farms when necessary um, to make sure, you know, we meet the response times that are necessary. Awesome. All right, Dino, I'm coming to you on this one. So we're going to move next questions here because you have been a long advocate for trying to clean up crappy supplier data. Um, so one of the things we hear about the most, I think the best practice committee is kind of trying to take this on uh, pretty heavily, is variances in product uh, supplier data. Uh, I guess, you know, experiences in this, any recommendations you can make for suppliers to kind of, you know, what, what's some low hanging fruit for suppliers when it comes to product data? Um, well, I, I always, I like to echo uh, Eric Schoenbarger's comments. You know, if you want to know how good your data is, try eating your own dog food. Um, and so what we do to help some of our suppliers who are um, trying to get their data aligned with the framework and using the standard, you know, plugin that we provide is we actually can give them the unique perspective of, you know, here's what it looks like to your consumers through the NetSuite platform. So they can make calls out through our QA tool, see from a distributor perspective what their item data looks like, see, because we provide a consolidated top line view, product data, some imagery, as well as the PPC at a detail level. So they can see all aspects of those coming together and snapping together within a single screen and drill down and make sure that what's coming through to their distributor customer is usable, consumable. They know what NetSuite is as a, as they run their business on it. So to be able to see it from the consumer perspective within that familiar framework makes it really easy for them to get things aligned and cleaned up properly. Yeah, it's uh, the eating your own dog food. Uh, it's something uh, Starline went through that journey and we converted our entire website over to use promo standards. And uh, if you want to get your product data fixed, just wait till your marketing department is hammering you for bad data. It's a uh, much uh, the ROI and the uh, response time is much quicker when when they're sitting in the office next door beating the crap out of you. Um, sure. Chris, uh, any 
you know, suggestions, things here, what has to do with, uh, or issues you see with product supplier data? I know you guys are cleaning it up a lot yourself, but you know, what's your experience here? Yeah, I think that again, it goes all goes back to air reporting back to the supplier so they know what the problems are. Um, we have our perspective as end user distributor supplier. So we have, you know, we get comments from, you know, all the way down to end user websites. So we have to make sure the products, you know, live up to the potential all the way down to the end user. Um, currently, we run over 200 plus quality checks when ingesting product data into our database. So, you know, again, by the time someone's using our API to pull pro promo standards data, they should at least be, you know, feel comfortable that the product data coming back is quality checked and fits the standard across all suppliers. All right. I, I didn't, I just didn't say I was going to ask this question, but uh, I guess I'll put you guys all on the spot. Uh, what, I guess if you have one, I'd love to hear, like, what's your dirtiest data hack that you're doing on the way in for product data? I mean, I'm sure you all have that if PCNA, if Starline do this. I mean, Robert, do you have any you have some customizations on product data. We've got a whole table in our, our database called Promo Standards Quirks for each of the <laughs> individual suppliers that comes in. It, it's mostly, it's not so much the ingestion, which we work with the suppliers to, to fix before uh, we, go, we go live with it. It's, it's more when we're creating purchase orders, there's lots of um, different ways that different algorithms people use for generating pricing. Um, there's deficiencies in the standards like no mandatory charges or you can't have charges if you don't have a decoration location and there's charges that don't necessarily appear in, in the PPC data, such as, I don't know, if you've got rush fees or less than minimum charges, they're, they're not standardly occurring in. So there, there's a lot of, um, of these, um, I don't know, We've made certain uh, conventions with various uh, suppliers that we use to work around these these spec deficiencies that should be cor corrected in the next edition. Yes, I agree. Uh, Steve, supplier uh, product data or just product data in general. I mean, is there any variances you guys see at Ascent? What are what's your recommendation? We we do see um, on occasion we do see some some of that. And what we do is we have pretty much sets of tables that are used as cross references. Um, for specific suppliers so that when you see something from them, it can automatically convert it into the good data. And, you know, that grows over time. Oh, one thing I would recommend, especially when, you know, Robert kind of hit it, don't just assume that because you have an endpoint out there um, that everybody's going to know exactly how to um, run with it. Uh, I would recommend, especially from a supplier side, you know, only more complex services, maybe throw together an onboarding guide um, you know, pro, it's not promo standards role to, you know, uh, host your own boarding guide, but you see a lot more suppliers and distributors and service providers hosting pages of like, you know, I think Halo has been pretty big on this is, you know, we're, uh, yeah, Halo gave to the entire supplier community, we're about to consume your order status, this is what we expect. Well, then on the supplier side, I started to see more and more documents of this is how we've implemented, this is how the data we provide for purchase orders or for PPC. I mean, the more proactive you can be, um, the easier that communication is. But I would say the, the more complex services like PPC and POs, you know, do that proactive work, write out some of that documentation up front and make your life a little easier. Um, do you know anything to add on the product data? No, well, we already got you on that one. Uh, anybody else want to chime in before we move on? I think categories is the one that we we keep them going back to um, standardizing categories. We do that you know, with mappings again, and it's a big thing for the industry with categories and assignment to product. I think that could be a place to improve on. But yeah, it's one of the things I think you know Eric and his crew and the standards committee we constantly bring this up, and it's like, what's the base category list we're going to use, right? Are we going to use a Google esque product categorization, and then you think me, me, Google me, my marketing department, who's like, no, I want this to be in six different categories, right? So I think at some point, yes, there's the separating the real use cases of this data from the, you know, marketing-esque uh, desires that a lot of them have put in for it. Um, all right, let's move on to authentication. Um, I guess everybody's got a beef to pick with authentication. I think as service providers, we uh, promo standards hears this from you guys the most, you all the most. Um, I guess uh, let's start with, uh, you all have interesting solutions for us. So that's why I put this topic on there. 
Uh, Chris, while you're here, you know, authentication, what's, what's your beef? I know you guys have put some solutions in place uh, yourself. And kind of what's brewing on authentication? Yeah. Uh, we wanted to keep this really simple. Authentication is happening in the industry and has been forever. You know, and we've been authenticating orders by addresses and names of companies for, for years. So, you know, I stepped back and really considered, well, what is the difference between that and what we're doing as service providers, you know? And so what we're doing in, from our respect is we're trying to get orders over to suppliers as easy as possible. You know, we feel like the, the supplier will accept an order if, you know, if it's an order that's actually revenue for them, they'll figure out how to match this up to an account internally. Um, you know, and, you know, at the end of the day, that's what's happening with paper purchase orders today. Um, and so what we're doing is we're using email uh, for authentication, we're keeping it real simple. First time a purchase order gets sent to a supplier and the distributor hasn't done business with them before, that purchase order gets sent through email with the top saying, add your credentials here. Um, the supplier can add it at that point, and that next order that comes through will be automatically credentialed. So trying to proactively deal with it from an order perspective, not as a give me all your customers and let's authenticate them before. Let's do it on an order, you know, first time order basis. Awesome. Uh, Robert, I'll flip the, uh, you guys kind of flipped the script and made it supplier's uh, prerogative to do it. Uh, any authentication tips, beef, just kind of what you guys are doing? Yeah. Um... Yeah, we, we provide uh, uh, just a, a web page, part of our app where suppliers can go in and they can provide credentials for any distributors that they they have accounts with um, on our system. Um, my my preference for this, I think there's two ways this can be solved in, in the long term. One would be for an organization like Promo Standards to host a uh, a an authentication service. I think that has political challenges that are probably not easily overcome. The second uh, would be uh, a using OAuth2 with the suppliers as OAuth2 providers, which would allow service providers to be um, to use uh, clients' data with their authorization. And I think that's more of a technical challenge, which is probably easier to implement in the end. And just on that, I know that the board has earmarked some budget this year to, I think, to, to look at this problem and to look at outside companies, right? I think, to your point, Promo Standards itself, the organization, uh, it would be tricky, you know, I, of, of managing that and the security aspects of it. But if we could partner with a, there are lots of uh, authentication and OAuth you know, companies out there that do this for a living for nonprofits. So uh, I know Eric and Jose Bernal, who's with uh, PCNA, they've been um, kind of poking down this path here. So hopefully we get some solutions there. Uh, Dino or Steve, you want to add anything on authentication before we move on? Uh, I would just add in there that you know, um, with regards to setting up and creating those authentications, you know, the challenge would be on an ongoing basis is, especially with the industry consolidation that's always happening, I mean, I had a particular use case last year when we were spinning up the invoice service for a good side dis distributor. They were calling out for invoices from this top 40 supplier and they were getting uh, purchase orders or invoice responses for a distributor that was not there, no longer a member of that buying group and it was actually rolled up into another company's now. So I think that gets to be a real challenge for, on the supplier side with managing those credentials. And making sure they're kept up to date. Yeah, exactly. I think it's you know that's been tricky as why as acquisitions happen or somebody jump from one group to the next is figuring out the ownership of who is actually doing that. And I think some of the service providers, I know Robert, you guys have been pretty aggressive at, hey, this is the last PO number that we sent you guys for this distributor, so you can match it up in your system, right? I think you know it kind of goes both ways, but yes, I think the days of just like here's some credentials and hoping that nothing ever happens. I think there's some, you know, onus on management on the supplier side to, you know, maybe once a year, rip through your credentials, see who's consuming and make sure that those are still, you know, legit people. Uh, Steve, anything to add on credentialing yeah. before we move yeah. on? Just briefly, I, I don't have a specific solution in mind, but I do think that the companies themselves should control their credentials that they get from the suppliers and that it should be up to them through some mechanism to allow the service providers access to use them. And that way then they can quickly, if they jump buying groups, they can just turn it off, enable it for, you know, wherever they move to. 
um, and that they're in control. And then technically then, you know, which is a concern for a lot of the suppliers where we host their endpoints is, you know, I get this call from, you know, Distributor Central or Common SKU, you know, how do I know definitively that all the companies are requesting are companies on their platform? You know, yeah. and that comes up regularly. So having some solution that could help solve that and make it easier for the service providers, um, that would be great. All right. Best um, practice, I would suggest that um, instead of using the real passwords that uh, suppliers use tokens or something that they can easily revoke and just. Yeah, exactly. It's a good, good uh, best practice there. Um, all right, Robert. Well, while we got you here, uh, per POs, you already beat the crap out of suppliers a little bit for uh, bad PO data. I guess the biggest hurdle, uh, you know, when you guys went down that implementation path, I guess both for, you know, suppliers, you know, and just, uh, you know, yourself, I mean, what, what, what was the like biggest thing that you had to overcome? Um, there, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, <laughs> one is that everybody does it slightly differently and there's a lot of optional fields. Um, some of which are mandatory for some suppliers. Um, a second thing is that um, there's no standard algorithm to calculate costs uh, based on the data you receive from, from the PPC endpoints. So that can be slightly different. I advocate some an additive pricing model, which there are some discussions in the yeah, if anybody chance. has an opinion on the added depressing model, <laughs> chime in in Slack. It's a very lively discussion. So, yeah, um, it's it's very nice when uh, location names and charge names are things that we can present to the uh, the distributors directly, and that they can even present to their clients. Yeah, that's a great point. Just because your OE team for 20 years has known what this word means, don't expect that when you pass that charge along throughout your community, that the end user, now that you're exposing those charges, is going to have any clue what that means. So that's a great point. Yeah, th th there's just some. And understanding and using Y units of measure, um, there needs to be a bit more guidance on, on that, I think. Um, yeah, I know Dino and Sam and crew has, has gone down this, this path too. Um, do you know any tips, anything implementing purchase orders, you know, biggest hurdle, anything that you want to touch on? Um, the biggest hurdles that I've encountered with distributors I'm working with are uh, configuration details that are very nuanced and program specific. Uh, that's really the heavy lift. Most of our stuff can go in and it's plug and play and you're locked and loaded and start pushing POs. E-commerce guys that are just shooting out blanks to the big apparel suppliers, those go easy. It's the deco pieces that get a lot of nuance and we have to get, connect both sides of the equation and do the mapping routine the way they want to have it land in the supplier system. Chris, I know you guys have been on this PO journey pretty heavily in the last few months. Uh, anything that you know you want to recommend or kind of that you've seen hurdle wise so other suppliers kind of know to, you know, what to anticipate? Sure, the biggest challenge we've had is actually uh, getting test distributor credentials to test orders with from a service provider perspective. Um, a lot of suppliers that like throws a monkey rich into their system a lot of the times, <laughs> they always expect me to be sending a real test order from a distributor of theirs. Um, so that's been actually the slowest part of our onboarding process is just trying to get the supplier to be able to receive a test order. Our, our onboarding process is we have to test an order or two with you, you know, out of our system before we'll turn you on just so we know you're going to get a good order. Um, so. That's a, I mean, we've, you know, we went through this journey with you guys and a few others. Um, having a fully functioning test system for your POs is huge. Uh, for example, we, we, were, we had test PO endpoints, but we weren't automatically validating them and then serving them back up in our order status services in our test environment, right? Everything works perfect in your production environment, but it's getting that test environment up to speed to where when Chris posts a PO there, you're running it through your, your data validation, through your you know, internal business logic. And then they expect, I would say a lot of people then expect that even in your test environment, after I send you that PO within a fixed time limit, I should be able to query your order status service and see if it's there and get a response from it. So that's a great tip is, you know, make sure like these things don't happen in a vacuum. Uh, people's environments, test environments have to be up to speed. Uh, and to Chris's point, you know, just 
Yeah, trust me, the last thing you want is these guys uh, live firing a PO for the first time into your production system. Um, it, it's it's not, not good for anybody. Um, Steve, anything on the on the PO journey? I know you were part of the ones who drafted it and kind of been yeah. involved in it. Anything there? Yeah, one, one of the things we see is, you know, with the version one of, of the PO service and the PPC service, there is, you know, some missing components. There is a lot of different avenues you can take even in populating the PO that it wasn't just thought of like this is a blank or a, you know, blank item versus a decorated item. Sometimes you may be able to populate some of that even on a simple PO. Um, that makes it a bit more complicated to handle. Um, the other thing that we have seen, which is kind of odd, other than, you know, sometimes you'll see required fields that are just not in the request, um, but we're also seeing fields that are not even in the specification included in the posted XML, which is kind of interesting. I'm surprised that service uh, allows that to come in that way. Um, no, that's interesting. You know, I think at the end of the day, it, it's good to see, to, to hear some of the, the pain points to know, you know, I think, you know, we've onboarded tons of, of POs um, over the last two years. And I think every time you learn a little bit and get slightly better at it. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the value of a distributor or a supplier using the service providers of the industry uh, is that you've, you have all seen it you know, 20 times over and you know what to expect, right? It's, it's one thing for me and my team to be like, ah, oh, crap, like we have to solve this problem. But you guys are pretty much built to solve these problems. And you know, the software providers, people selling software in the industry, they're already handling this. So it's not always the best solution that you just let these guys deal with it. But at the end of the day, the, this is what they do. I mean, they're very much, you know, until like you heard what, um, what Robert said, he has a whole table that handles some nuances from different suppliers. It's not ideal that he has to have that, but they, they know what to anticipate when building these services out. So yes, you know, I think the POs and invoices and PPC has the highest ultimate ROI. Just don't expect that you're just gonna flip a switch and just sit back and enjoy the promised land. Um, have you got, I don't know, have we, I'm just looking through the chat here, see if we missed anything. I, I um, do have one more thing to add on that, yeah, John. Sure, um, just that, you know, being that they are rev ones of the services, um, when you find issues that you can't solve or things that seem like workarounds or whatever, get, um, put it on the Slack channel. We are eventually going to be looking into a purchase order version two and a PPC version two. And the more feedback we can get, we can incorporate that into the next rev of the spec. So hopefully it'll be more streamlined, easier to use, more intuitive and give you better data. All right, so the Q&A here I see, uh, Brett asked a question. Um, best practice standards on media content field part ID. Are there some relationship categories which exist, for example, last digits? Um, that's interesting. So uh, Brett, I guess speaking from Starline's experience, we built our part IDs to try to mimic the configurations up to a certain point. So for example, we're product code, color code, size ID is how our part IDs. But I would say I've seen a lot of other part IDs are straight up numerical or straight up text. Um, Aaron, if you're on here, this would be a good one um, for you guys and your uh, committee to tackle in Slack is, you know, what are the benefits, pros and cons of trying to have a contextual part ID that means something. Um, I know we use, we use it as a hack inbound to, um, you know, we, we separate the part ID from the, uh, the color code from the size ID. And that's how we're using it as a, mat, a QC check to make sure that we're, we're grabbing the right SKU in our system. So um, that's interesting. Uh, Paul Fleischman, if you're here, I'm gonna call you out. If not, I'm gonna text you. Um, Brett, I'll hit up Paul to, uh, with your specific question here. Uh, you're probably working with Paul already at PCNA, but uh, it's a great question. Uh, but if I'm going to 100% kick that over to Aaron to in the best practices committee to tackle that. So it's a, it's a great nuance, um, the part IDs. Uh, We've actually already started talking about that. Oh, really? Sweet. So yeah, the, con the concern is more like on, on the apparel side. So you have, you know, seven, eight different sizes of the blue shirt. You don't really want to publish seven or eight times the same set of assets at the part level. And that's where the real problem comes into play. If you're just selling a ball that comes in five colors, great. You get the five images for the different colors. It's great. But where you have 
you know, those matrix types of items with apparel, that's, that's where the real problem is right now with the current version. Awesome. All right, any, uh, guys, before we wrap up here, anything else you want to add? Anything, shout outs, anything before? Now's your time. No, we're good. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you, everybody. Next month's education session is that order status 2.0 beta preview. Uh, there was a question in, in the comments here, how to get involved. Uh, if you're not in Slack because you're not a member, if you're not a member, you want to be, hit up Jessica. She is uh, admin at promostandards.org. Uh, she will get everything you need to know. But yeah, Slack, and we keep referring to Slack channels, uh, hit Slack up, uh, you know, stay active in there. I would say there's 250 technologists in the industry who you can just straight up DM and they'll get back to you. Um, it's the quickest way to connect with the technology community inside our industry. So hit that up, um, stay involved, and that's all I got. So thank you, everybody. It's been real. Uh, thanks all the panelists. You guys are super informative. Uh, I learned a bunch, wrote a bunch of stuff down that I want to look at in our data now when I get done with this. So awesome. Thanks. Good job, everybody. Thank you.